The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. A warm welcome to this UK IBC webinar in partnership with HSBC, PwC and Freshfields Brookhouse Derringer. Um, it's a glorious day here just outside of London and I hope the weather gods are being kind to you wherever you're listening in to this webinar. Today we will be focusing on the Indian economy post COVID-19 and getting the thoughts from our experts on what the rest of 2020 has to hold and also the start of 2021. My name is Chris Hayes. I am one of the directors here at UK IBC. I head up the membership team as well as leading on the professional services sector. As always, I hope you and your families are all staying safe and well during these unprecedented times. As you will have heard from our previous webinars, this is one of a series that we have undertaken to ensure that our network is kept up to date as possible on key matters. Last week, we looked at unlocking your business in India and the legislation and best practices around returning safely. Our next webinar on the 14th of July, will look at the impact of COVID-19 on the world of work and particularly on online education. Feel free to sign up for this on our website where you'll also find recordings of our previous events in case you've missed them. To keep up to date with all of our events and developments, feel free to follow us on Twitter. And as you can see on your screen now, there are the Twitter handles for all the organizations that are involved in today's webinar. You can also search on LinkedIn for UK India Business Council or the other organisations. And finally, you can sign up for our newsletter, should you wish, on ukibc.com. Before we start, as usual, some housekeeping. You will all be automatically placed on mute for the entire session. However, you will notice in the right hand corner of your screen, there is a question box. Feel free at any time during this webinar session to ask questions, they will come through to me and then I will be able to pose these questions to the panellists at the end of the session. You will also be glad to know that we are recording the session, which will be placed on our website afterwards and a link emailed to you all in case there are any sections that you would like to re-listen to or if you'd wish to share this with your colleagues or your networks. So the topic of today is the Indian economy post COVID-19. Last week, many of you will have read that rating agencies Fitch said the coronavirus pandemic has significantly weakened the India's growth outlook for this year and exposed the challenges associated with a high public debt burden. It downgraded India's outlook from stable to negative, matching that of other rating agency Moody's view. Many observers say the Indian economy will contract by 4% in the current year owing to the lockdown. However, there are expectations of a big bounce back next year with around 9.5% growth in 2021. This as always though, does not tell the full story. As you all know, many sectors have been more affected than others. Telecommunications, IT services, and the pharma industry have been far less affected than say the airline industry, the travel industry, or even the automobile, automotive industry. And I guess the final piece of the jigsaw that we'll look at today is that unfortunately there will be a number of businesses that will no longer be viable in their current scale as we move towards this new normal. And therefore cash rich businesses may see acquisition opportunities and those struggling might see opportunities via mergers to reduce their cost base via shared services, facilities, and even staff. Support us, to support us through these difficult challenges, we have an expert panel to help us look at the macroeconomic challenges as well as some of the fiscal measures the Indian government has put in place. I'm delighted to welcome our first panelist, Pranjal Bandrari. As Chief Economist at HSBC Securities and Capital Markets in India, Pranjal is responsible for developing the firm's position on macroeconomics and public policy in India, as well as leading on the economics research franchise from Mumbai. Prior to joining HSBC, she completed a resident fellowship at the IMF in Washington, DC, after graduating as a Mason Fellow from the Harvard Kennedy School. Previously, she worked at India's Ministry of Finance with the Chief Economic Advisor and at the Planning, sorry, and at the Planning Commission with the Deputy Chairman. 
She has also held roles as an economist covering Asian markets at Goldman Sachs and the UK's Department for International Development. Pranjal holds a Master's in Economics from the University of Cambridge in the UK, as well as a BA in Economics from St. Stephen's College in New Delhi. Pranjal, really looking forward to your opening comments. So over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, and good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for joining the call. Uh, I'm going to try to give you a brief overview of the macroeconomy in the next couple of minutes. Uh, but before I dive into that, you know, a word on the pandemic itself. Uh, despite a very strict lockdown in India over the months of March and April, uh, the number of confirmed cases are running at 400,000. Uh, we're seeing about 15,000 new cases day and same time last month we were seeing 5,000 new cases every day so uh, in terms of the COVID case load India is still on the acceleration curve the big question that I'm getting is why didn't the lockdown help uh, and, and to be honest uh, I see it the other way around things could have been even worse uh, had we not gone into a lockdown uh, so perhaps we need to compare with the correct counterfactual and then the other question I get is uh, why did India open up? You know, if the daily cases are rising, why did the country open up? Uh, and I think the way you look at it, at that is, uh, you know, the economic cost. The economic cost uh, was very high, uh, and the debt rate from the pandemic was relatively low. You know, the debt rate right now is 3.2 percent. The global average is closer to 6 percent. So the general understanding was, even if a lot of people get it, most will recover and get to work in a matter of a few weeks. So why incur this great economic cost? And I think with, with that in mind, uh, the authorities decided to open up. Uh, so looking at the macro economy now, uh, things are looking good. Uh, June has been great. Uh, the country began to open up uh, in May, uh, opened up a bit more in June. And we're seeing that in a lot of the data that we track. For example, mobility data, electricity consumption data, e-way bills generated, labor force participation, even the unemployment rate has fallen from 24% in early April to about 10% in early June. Now, what's really driving this wave of growth? Uh, in my mind, it's postponed and pent up consumption demand. Uh, unlike a country like Singapore, which was given a notice of about five days before it went into lockdown, Indians weren't. Uh, they were told at eight p.m. that from 12 midnight they would be uh, you know in a, in a lockdown they didn't get time to uh, stock up and it's this stocking of demand that is playing out right now people are demanding a lot of things retailers are restocking their inventories and manufacturers are producing those things so we're seeing growth tick up and I think this is going to continue all of June uh, and hopefully all of July as well the big question is what after once this initial wave of consumption demand, this pent up consumption demand is gone, what will support growth? And to look at that, we actually went into two decades of data looking at previous slowdowns and how India had come out of those. What we found was that when India is coming out of a lockdown, it moves up the value chain of growth. Uh, for example, uh, it probably starts off with uh, households demanding a lot of essential goods like clothing like food and then moving up the value chain and demanding more expensive things like uh, which we call discretionary goods like air conditioners uh, two wheelers maybe even houses and then finally uh, we go to what is the gold standard of growth which is investment this is the value chain of growth as i see it but every time we've had a successful recovery in the past, there have been some enabling factors that have made it possible so coming out of the global financial crisis it was the government the government uh, had a lot of space to expand. It gave a very large fiscal stimulus, almost a permanent fiscal stimulus, and that really solidified the recovery. Back in 2014, when India was coming out of a out of a slowdown, uh, the shadow banks were, had a lot of money. They were very liquid. They were very uh, willing to give out loans, and consumers were able to take these loans and buy a lot of consumer uh, non-durables. And there was a nice uh, nexus between India shadow banks and, uh, and 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 demand for consumer durables and 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 uh, non-discretionary items. 
this really solidified India's growth at that point. Unfortunately, we don't have any such enablers this time. Even before the pandemic, the government was staring at a very stretched balance sheet. Uh, its public debt was at 72% of GDP, which is very high. Uh, India's shadow banks were facing a lot of liquidity problem. They were not very keen to give out loans the way they had been in the last several years. So we don't have any of these enabling uh, enablers this time. So to cut a long story short, I think once the first wave of growth and activity goes, then India has a growth problem. Uh, what does this mean in terms of numbers? Uh, uh, for this year, which is fiscal year 21, we think growth will contract by 7.2%. Uh, for the next year, we think growth will expand by 7.2%. Uh, this looks like a very sharp recovery, but the truth is that a lot of this will be uh, led by um, just a, a, a low statistical base. Uh, there could be an element of postponed services demand, you know, the fact that a lot of people haven't taken holidays this year, haven't traveled. So next year, uh, if and when the pandemic is behind us, a lot of people will want to take holidays. So there could be a pent up demand for uh, travel services. But again, it would be a one off and I don't think it will be something long lasting, uh, which brings me to the question of potential growth. Where will India's growth potential be for the next two to four years, which is the medium term? Uh, but, but before I get into that, a small history on potential growth. You know, before the global financial crisis, India's potential growth was close to 7%. Just before the pandemic, India's potential growth by our calculation was to about, uh, it was already declining. And we believe that through this pandemic, it will decline further by about one percentage point and come down to about 5%. What will be the driver of a lower potential growth? Uh, there are two things that everybody talks about. One is labor, labor issues. And the second is the health of the financial system. Now, we, we know that about 30 million Indians working in urban India have gone back home to their rural villages. There has been a huge amount of labor, dis labor disruption. But while I think it's going to weigh on this year's growth, I don't think it's going to weigh on uh, the medium term growth. And the reason is many of the people who live in rural India and work in urban, uh, uh, you know, migrate because of aspirational reasons. And I think that will continue because not, there's not very much to do in rural India. So I don't think that will be the major, main, the major drag. I think the major drag instead will be the health of the financial system. Even before uh, the pandemic, uh, the non-performing loans at banks were elevated. And through the process, if they get elevated even more, then banks will become fairly risk averse and may not be very willing to give out loans freely in the medium term. Even the shadow banks are having huge liquidity problems. Uh, and if generally loan growth is weak, then who will fund India's growth? And India may see a, a fall in its potential growth. So we think the health of the financial system will be the main drag uh, in the one percentage point fall in India's potential growth from 6% to 5%. But just to put this in context, it is likely that potential growth will be falling in many countries around the world. And you know, India may not be a uh, stand, may, may not be a standalone. Uh, and then coming to my final section, which is have the authorities, both the government and also the, the central bank, have they done enough? And, and, and to answer this, I'll, uh, you know, I'll lean on the template of St. Francis of Assisi from 800 years ago. You know, he said, start by doing what's necessary, then do what's possible. And suddenly you're doing the impossible. I do think that the authorities have done the necessary. The government has given free grains, cash transfers, loan guarantees to small businesses. The RBI has cut uh, the policy repo rate, infused liquidity, uh, and also eased regulation quite a bit. Uh, but they haven't done everything that's possible. So what more could they do? I would think that one, they can do better implementation of what is already announced. For example, a large loan guarantee program has been announced for small businesses, but to make it functional and make it easily accessible is the big challenge that will be faced right now. Second, you can do more of what you've already been doing. So I think because inflation is slow, so low, RBI can uh, uh, cut rates further uh, by about 50 basis points. A lot of cash handouts have been given to the rural poor. Perhaps some money can be put aside for the urban poor. 
Uh, and, and finally, some new steps, for example, recapitalizing India's banks, which will probably get most hurt in this, in this slowdown and see a huge rise in non-performing loans. Um, and, and finally, you know, reforms. India can never shy away from reforms. I think any reform that it can do, which tackles the reason uh, why the NPLs at banks were, were, were building up even before the pandemic will be very useful. Things to uh, make it easier to acquire land, uh, to get access to uh, stable power and electricity, transportation infrastructure, all of these reforms will be very important. And, and anything for banks, for example, more recapitalization for banks who have been hit hard uh, even before the pandemic and now through the pandemic will be very important. So many important steps have been taken, but many more uh, are, uh, are, are still necessary. And, and just before ending, you know, I've been fairly negative, but I'll let me end with some sort of bit of positives. You know, in the past, we've never really seen a growth problem in India. We've seen a macro stability problem, high inflation, wide current account deficit. This time, thankfully, inflation is uh, under control, which is the reason the RBI is being able to cut rates. Uh, the current account deficit, the trade deficit has narrowed quite a lot, which is keeping the rupee relatively strong. So I think these are positives uh, that cannot be ignored. And there are a few sectors, for example, IT exports, which could uh, benefit from this uh, pandemic, uh, you know, as working from home becomes comes more in vogue. So with this, I will hand it over to the next speaker. Huge thanks for that, Pranjal. I think that was, you know, a very um, insightful overview. Um, I think given the the challenge at the moment, anybody trying to make those predictions in terms of the economic GDP numbers um, it is really difficult. But interesting to see your analysis of the 7.2% drop or the 7.2% drop uh, increase next year. Sorry. And again, that, that idea of focusing on those structural reforms and obviously Mr. Modi's been talking about land, labour and liquidity as being the, the, the essentials. And that's definitely something that we're seeing at, at UK IPC. Um, I think next what we're going to do is we're going to delve a little deeper into some of the key sectors. Um, and we've got our second panellist, uh, Vadison Krishnamati. Vadison is a partner of the deals practice at PwC India and leads on the India-UK corridor for the firm. He has over 18 years of dedicated deals experience, of which eight of them were in the UK. Faddison specializes in providing deal advisory services to both private equity and corporate clients in relation to acquisitions and disposals. He works with the UK companies looking to invest in or trade with India, and similarly with Indian companies looking to invest in the UK. Up until last year, he was an influential member of the UK IBC's India board. Faddison is also a chartered accountant and a certified public accountant. Faddison, really looking forward to your comments, particularly on the sectors. Oh, <clears throat> thanks, Chris. Um, so good morning to all the participants who are logged in from the UK and good afternoon to, to all the participants from India. Now, I think, uh, Pranjal did a great job of setting the context for me to talk about the different sectors. I mean, if at all, she made my uh, my storytelling a bit more easier, I should say. So, so just to get the ball rolling, uh, the next slide. Yeah, so India, as we all know, imposed one of the most stringent lockdowns. So other than movement and supply of essential goods, economic activity came to a virtual standstill. So arguably, every sector has seen some impact. Now, what I've tried to do is capture the impact on the different sectors and the estimated timeline for recovery in a very, shall we say, simplistic three by three matrix. And that's the table that you see on your screen. Now, what are some of the key themes that you're observing? Half of the sectors are seeing a high impact. Most of the high impact sectors, in our view, will take well over nine months to recover. Sectors which have a very high element of discretionary spend are seeing a high impact and will take a long time to recover. Now, for example, if you take the, the top left box, which is the red and greater than nine months, what you notice is that these are some sectors which have a very high element of discretionary customer spend. So you got auto, you got media and entertainment, which is largely cinemas, malls, sporting events, you got real estate, 
you got uh, travel and tourism, which is airlines um, and hotels. So the point being that people are keen to conserve cash and deferring buying decisions. They're not rushing to buy a real estate property or, or even for that matter, looking for a beach holiday. The next theme is that sectors which have an omni-channel or the ability to switch to an online model will see a faster rebound. And that's, that's the amber uh, category. Now, there are two examples that stand out here. One is retail and education. Now, retail has its own nuances. So if I take education as an example, and again, within that, if I focus on higher education, what we're seeing is that the number of undergrad applications or enrollments from India for foreign universities for on-campus learning have dropped considerably this year. The two reasons, one, parents and students are not comfortable uh, given the concerns around a second wave. And number two, especially for undergrad programs where the parents eventually end up funding the, the, the courses, they are not sure whether they can support a four-year commitment because of the own uncertainty around job levels and income. So on the other hand, if you look at edtech or online learning, online learning is seeing a huge surge in demand from both corporates and individuals. Remote learning or, or, or digital education has become center stage today. Companies and individuals are realizing the benefits of online learning. I mean, effectively, you have access to, to the world-class materials and the faculty as well. So we're seeing a fundamental shift in how education is getting, being imparted and how learnings are taking place. Now, while we expect most sectors to, to kind of rebound within a year, there are certain sectors which will probably take well over 18, 24 months, even longer for that matter. A, a classic example is airlines. While, while domestic travel and passenger volumes should come back in 12 months time, I firmly believe that international travel and passenger volumes are unlikely to come back to pre-COVID levels, not before 2022. Now, the, the one of the sectors I just, just want to call out out here is financial services. I think uh, Pranjul uh, briefly alluded, alluded to that as well. Now, what we're noticing is, especially on banks, banks are getting increasingly risk covers. Well, they're, sitting, they're flushed with liquidity. They're being much more discerning on who they lend to because they're not able to assess themselves. What is the financial position or what has COVID done to the financial health of the individual and corporate borrowers? Now, credit, as we know, is a lifeline of the economy. So for the overall economic recovery, credit has to start flowing, both corporates and individuals. And, and that's the reason why you see the government of India and the Reserve Bank of India actively focused on nudging banks to start lending. Because that will in a way determine how quickly some of the sectors rebound. Because liquidity crunch is one of the main pain points that most sectors are seeing today. Next slide. Thanks. So what I've done in the next three slides is I've just taken one sector from each of the categories, which is red, amber, and green, and just try to call out some of the key uh, demand and supply themes. Now, auto, I mean, auto even was struggling as a sector even before COVID-19. So auto is a discretionary spend. And um, while dealerships have opened up across most parts of the country, what we're noticing is that demand is still very muted. Now, car is a luxury product, and uh, so customers are effectively deferring the buying positions. People are more keen on conserving cash. And interestingly, it's not just domestic demand, but even exports are shrinking. India exports roughly around the nine to ten billion dollars of uh, cars and auto components, and half of that goes to to to, to North America and Europe. And given the given the global recession, not surprisingly, even export demand is shrinking. On the supply side, what we're noticing is that suppliers are keen to push out new product launches to the following year. The other thing about this sector is that there is a high dependence on imports from China for key parts and accessories. We saw almost 45 days of supply disruption. So companies which are highly dependent on imports from China have been far more impacted than companies that are not. Next slide, please. 
So just on infra, I think on infra, the government is a, is a very key player on, on the infra space. And uh, government resources and machinery is focused on fighting COVID-19. So there is a slowdown, both in government spending, on infra, and awarding of new projects. In fact, new project launches and execution are getting delayed. I mean, what you're also noticing is that because of the supply chain disruptions, existing projects are struggling. And to add to that, you also have the reverse migration of laborers. This again is impacting both ongoing and the start of new projects, as we are not sure how many of them will come back. The one other point that I want to call out here is the financial issues among stakeholders, contractors, and subcontractors, because as I was mentioning, the we believe a lot of these contractors and subcontractors are literally staring at bankruptcies. So unless banks start lending and you saw you see the equity flowing through the market, a lot of these guys could be staring at bankruptcy. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, Agri, uh, Agri is the silver lining. Uh, we have had uh, uh, record production of food, fruits and vegetables. It's at a, at a five-year high, and thanks to some uh, favorable weather conditions. Now, monsoon is forecast to be near normal uh, for this year, which will be favorable, favorable for several crops. Uh, the government of India has announced a, a fairly sizable stimulus package, which are focused on um, strengthening infrastructure and logistics. Uh, in addition, there are also other measures around pricing and direct procurement, which the government has announced, which should also be a positive for this sector. Uh, finally, I think the, the reverse migration of laborers is also in a way positive for the agri sector because there will be no dearth of supply of labor for, for this sector. So net net, if there is one sector to cheer about, I think it is agree today. Now, just to summarize before I hand the microphone back to Chris, I mean, what we're saying is COVID-19 has had a significant impact on all sectors, but most sectors in our view should recover or rebound within a year, with the exception of select sectors like travel and tourism and auto, which will have a much longer uh, recovery time frame. Thanks, Chris, I'll just hand it back to you. Thanks very much for that, Madison. I think that, that was a, obviously looking at those those sectors that have accelerated their online journey. I think that's where you know, especially in the UK, we're seeing quite sort of significant growth. I guess the question is always around that sort of initial surge of discretionary spend that, that will happen as people are unlocked, and obviously making sure that that's factored into to future areas. And obviously, very interesting um, how the labor shortages in terms of the manufacturing are to the benefit of uh, the agriculture sector. So it's interesting to see those dynamics playing out at the moment. Uh, just before I come to our and introduce our final speaker, just to remind everybody, if you have any questions, please feel free, fill in the questions box. Um, after our last speaker, I'll be going to questions and we'll try to get through as many questions as possible. So finally, I'm delighted to welcome Payusha Bose to give us her views on the possible M&A activities, as well as her thoughts on the Indian economy. Payusha is a counsel at Freshfields Brookers Thuringa, based in London, where she co-heads the firm's global India group. Payusha specializes in high value and complex cross-border M&A deals with nearly 20 years of experience. Over the course of her career spanning London, New York, and India, Payusha has acted for many firms of the, many of the world's leading corporates, private equity firms and investment banks. Her practice covers a broad range of corporate transactions, including public and private mergers and acquisitions, reorganizations, joint ventures in jurisdictions across the world. She has also got extensive experience involving emerging markets such as India. Really looking forward to your comments and your opening remarks, Payusha. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to everyone joining from India. Uh, thank you very much to Pranjal and Vedasan for those very interesting perspectives. Uh, here are my thoughts on sort of M&A crystal ball gazing post-pandemic. Um, a question that everyone is asking across the world, and India is no exception, what is the future of M&A? Um, could we move on to the, the, the next slide? Yes, so is it doom and gloom? or possible recovery and opportunity? Um, as, and if there is recovery, when? 
as Chris Pranjal and Madison um, so eloquently explained, what we're seeing at the moment is really the highest level of macroeconomic uncertainty in modern history, and certainly nothing that my generation has ever seen before. And when there is uncertainty of this level, that impacts on it. SARS, uh, the only real comparison of pandemics in recent years, was a very different proposition. Uh, and in that case, m &E actually picked up after the crisis. But there, the impact wasn't the same on global markets and certainly wasn't the same on India. Um, so what does this mean? The great unknown, of course, remains how long the pandemic could last. Uh, what will life look like once we're on the other side? What will this new normal look like? Um, and what will the longer term impact be on India? For example, will m and surge to the pre-existing crisis level of m and or beyond? Uh, or are we looking at something akin to a sort of systemic global dislocation? The answers will really depend on what happens next. Uh, in India, the lockdown continues either in strict or partial form in some parts of the country. Um, as as Vedison explained uh, very eloquently just now, lending was already very fragile pre-pandemic. There was a liquidity crunch with various NBFC issues, and that adds further pressure to the ongoing pandemic related disruption. Indian businesses are under increasing pressure with existing liquidity concerns, which are being further exacerbated by the pandemic. So the longer the pandemic related disruption continues, the greater the challenges and more fragile any recovery of m and As with the rest of the world, it's no surprise that cash is really the, the world's hottest commodity right now. Cash conservation is the new mantra, uh, and that's true for consumers as well as corporates. And of course, that has an impact on the economy. Uh, as as Chris, Chris mentioned in his introduction, uh, I think the players who weather this crisis and emerge on the other side, and importantly, are able to be nimble and quick to adapt to change, will fare best. Um, there are cash-rich players who may emerge uh, and look to consolidate, look to acquire um, very sort of valuable targets. Uh, and so there is scope and there is opportunity, but what does that mean? Um, so if we move on to sort of M&A in terms of different types of M&A, how will M&A play out in India? I'll briefly touch on different types of investors, sectors, and overall FDI. If we take financial investors first, uh, 2019 was a record year, as some of you will know, uh, for buyout activity. There were sort of 45 deals with 12 billion uh, worth of value. Um, unsurprisingly, the 2020 has been very different. There's been a dramatic change with buyout activity having lost momentum, but that's no surprise. Um, however, many financial investors are sitting on dry powder and will be watching very closely. They'll be very keen to pick up good assets at attractive valuations. And so this is really a watch this space. Uh, and we will probably see financial investors starting the process probably sooner than say a strategic investor. Uh, strategic investors, uh, especially the in, in international ones. A lot of them tend to be longer term investors in India. They will want to be in India for a number of reasons, including global footprint, uh, and they will be watching very closely. Now, their activity levels will depend a little bit on which sector they operate in, what their own positions are like, and therefore m and in this space may be a little bit more different. It may occur slightly after financial investors, unless there are particularly compelling opportunities. Domestic M&A and consolidation is something I want to mention because that was happening even before COVID uh, and it was interesting to see that trend start uh, and it occurred across a range of different industries in technology, financial services, infra, uh, energy and that may well continue post-pandemic. Um, the other trend which I found very interesting emerging in India was around succession uh, and it was around promoters thinking about succession planning, uh, they were either considering selling, controlling stakes, or entering into joint ventures. Uh, and we may see that continuing post-pandemic as well. In a sense, we really could be looking <clears throat> and entering into a fairly transformative period uh, in the Indian business landscape. Uh, Vedison already talked about the impact of COVID on various sectors and recovery. I'm going to touch on a couple of them just from an M&A perspective uh, in terms of M&A in those sectors and when we might see that. Um, Healthcare and technology remain the what I'd call hot sectors. 
India is the largest uh, drug, the third largest drug producer by volume. Uh, and of course, the pandemic has drawn further attention and focus on the healthcare sector, um, healthcare providers, medical devices, pharmaceutical manufacturers, hospitals, healthcare tech is seen as particularly attractive right now. And there may well be a large focus uh, of MA activity around that. Uh, healthcare tech in particular, telemedicine and the sort of online uh, pharmacy development, that is a very uh, new area and could really develop uh, with lots of sort of M&A activity potentially occurring around there. Technology related M&A continues to generate interest and of course the remote working has seen further focus on e-commerce and consumer technology. Q2 of 2020 of course has seen increased M&A interest in the tech space so that continues. Um, there may well be an uptick in distressed M&A with opportunistic buyers looking for assets at attractive valuations. So the financial investors we talked about would be looking in this space. And additionally, companies that have managed to weather the pandemic may be looking to make um, invest into competitors that have done less well through the pandemic. So that's a potential area of opportunity. One of the trends we saw last year was government divestment. Um, governments are divesting some of their owned assets, and that may continue as well. Another topic I wanted to touch on at the moment, because that's a fairly hot topic, was global supply chains. Um, the question, of course, being raised and discussed uh, is whether in the longer term, global companies might look at India, uh, whether they want to diversify their supply chains, and if that's going to mean some sort of collateral benefits for Indian businesses. Uh, for example, will India benefit from the trade diversion because of the US-China tensions? Um, it's too early to say right now, and it's very much a watch this space. Uh, but that is another area where there could be potential potential movement. Um, there are sectors which will be slower to recover in terms of M&A. Um, Vedison mentioned aviation, uh, financial services as well, and I'd agree, I think M&A, unless there are particularly distressed situations coming up there, aviation, hospitality, financial services, uh, perhaps industrials and chemicals, M&A will probably take a bit longer there. Um, a few thoughts on uh, foreign direct investment in India. Unsurprisingly, uh, the Q1 year on year data declined for inbound transactions for FDI, but that isn't unsurprising. Um, there is a global theme emerging from the pandemic where governments have been stepping in to protect domestic companies, which either have been left weakened or uh, where the government is protecting perceived national interests. And that's been a global trend we've seen across the world. India is no different. And as people probably know, the government amended its foreign investment policy, uh, announcing that any investments by a neighboring country would now mandatorily require government approval. How this is interpreted and the impact that this has on FDI will be an area to watch very closely. Um, additionally, the geopolitical tensions with China at the moment, that could impact m and going forward. As people may have seen, I think the Maharashtra government today said that they were going to suspend certain investments from Chinese companies. So the impact of that dynamic will undoubtedly have some sort of an impact on FDI, and that will be another space to watch. Um, I think one of the points on the slide talks about m and taking a different form, shape, and speed. Um, what does that mean? Uh, all that really means is things may look a little bit different in the m and front immediately post-pandemic or even during the pandemic. For example, the way we do diligence may be a bit different. The narrative that the buyers and sellers have may be a bit different. And as you know, some people will know, one of the most important things for buyers when they're doing a diligence is understanding uh, what happens with the liability, who has the liability. Um, and that's usually tested by fairly detailed diligence. But in a world where we're living with lockdown, that constrains a buyer's ability to do robust diligence. We can't go to the site, we can't have physical meetings with management. What does a buyer do? How do they get to that level of certainty? So in a world where we can't do, you know, quote unquote, old school diligence, the buyers and the sellers will need to adapt uh, and perhaps Sellers will need to help the buyers through the diligence, give them more information, walk them through less than ideal financial inf information, and the buyers will need to really assess and test some of that information to be able to get comfortable on risk. Uh, 
So I think the way we do the deals will be a little bit different. We've done it before. Uh, there was the financial crisis. There have been other situations, all very different, that, the, that buyers and sellers may need to adapt a little bit. Um, so in conclusion, I think M&A is likely to continue. It may look a little bit different, and it, the different sectors may become relevant at different times. And the players may become relevant at different times, but I think MA will undoubtedly pick up. Chris, over to you. Thanks, Beja. Uh, again, another fantastic uh, overview, particularly interesting from my point of view in, in terms of the, that FDI activity, as you said, you know, many businesses not wanting that cash uh, and waiting for the timing to be right. And it'll be interesting to see uh, when, that, when that time does become right for those businesses. And um, just a final reminder, if you have any questions, please get them through to me and I'll put them through to the uh, panel. Um, but obviously, as chair's prerogative, I will start off. I have one question for, for each of you uh, just to get us in the mood. So, uh, Pranjal, just, just to start off with you, um, India's GDP growth has been declining now for three consecutive years, beginning in 2017-18, 8 8.3%. 16-17 fell to 7% and then 17-18 to 6.1%. Um, wh why do you think that that's been happening and um, what effect do you think that will have on India's ability to deal with the current economic disruption? Yeah, uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm very glad you asked that question uh, because I think uh, you know that that's a perspective which is very important. That growth was already falling before the pandemic, and I would uh, trace it back all the way to a decade ago when, uh, for the first time, we realized right after the global financial crisis that Indian India's banks were sitting on a big um, stock of non-performing loans, and India's companies were very indebted. Uh, we call that the twin balance sheet problem at that point. Uh, there was a lot of thinking about how to bring down the level of debt at both the banks and uh, and, and and the corporates but unfortunately uh, we didn't really succeed at that point uh, instead we just forgot about it and the twin balance sheet problem lingered on uh, the reason we forgot about it was we got distracted you know some temporary uh, feel goods came along the way for example oil prices fell and india got a growth boost at uh, some other point um, you know the public sector enterprises in india started borrowing and spending a lot that gave a growth boost as well but all of these were short lived uh, once uh, these went away we found that we were staring at the same problem from a decade ago the twin balance sheet problem except that it had become even worse and for about 10 years, we'd had practically like no big increase in investment. All the growth was consumption led. Real wages had been declining uh, steadily. Uh, and generally, the potential of the economy had come off. And, and, and you know, in numbers, uh, the potential growth of India had declined in a decade from about 7% to about 6%. So I'll trace it all back to the balance sheet problem, uh, you know, the NPLs at banks uh, and too much debt at the corporates. And it is this problem that could get exacerbated through the pandemic if the banking system sees more NPL stock up. Uh, and I think the big reform that is necessary right now is A, to understand why the NPLs were stocking up in the first place. Uh, you know, and I would say things like the fact, uh, you know, problems in acquiring land, problems in getting access to uh, uh, a stable power sector, to, to, to coal raw material, to transportation infrastructure. I think these are some of the key reasons why NPLs uh, were, were stocking up at banks. And second, to also understand how do you resolve this problem? Uh, basically, get the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code, a new institution that India has to work more efficiently than it has been working in the last year or so. So I think all of this is really, really important uh, for India to efficiently fight through the problems of the pandemic. Thanks very much for that. Uh, Vadison, just, just sort of looking at the sort of airline industry, you mentioned those challenges. I think we've had quite a few questions coming in about sort of the volumes that you mentioned, um, particularly in terms of the UK-India corridor. That's basically, um, unless you go for the Middle East on the direct carriers, it's reliant on three uh, carriers, Air India, who we know are currently up for sale, Virgin, who we know are currently trying to raise money, and British Airways, who have recently had to allow a lot of staff to go. Um, we saw airfares increase by around 30% when we lost Jet Airways. 
So what's your thoughts on the sort of industry and you know, do you feel that actually now that everybody is using Microsoft Teams, using Zoom, Google Hangouts, do you think there'll be less requirement for people to actually jump on a plane? Yeah, no, yes, Chris, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> um, so without doubt, I think, uh, see, as I was saying, I think uh, uh, travel and tourism is probably the, one of the most civil impacted sector. And a number of airlines have actually, in fact, uh, filed for bankruptcies. So, and um, uh, the desire to travel is, is just going to shrink. So while, as I was saying, I mean, I expect domestic travel to come back. I mean, uh, international travel, be it for, for business or even for pleasure, I think it's not going to come back at least for the next two years. Again, uh, th that's my prognosis. Now, I mean, unless, of course, we find a vaccine, I mean, uh, uh, in, in the near term. So that's my view, I think, uh, and more so now with, uh, as you rightly said, working from home and people getting used to and getting comfortable with uh, Zoom and uh, T uh, meetings and uh, Google Hangouts. Um, this sector is probably going to see the longest, uh, see, seeing the most significant pain. I mean, there are there are low occupancy in hotels that we are seeing. Uh, global travel restriction, restrictions continue to be there. And uh, as I was saying, I mean, I mean, this this sector is in for a lot of pain. I mean, millions of people are likely to lose jobs. And the only way the the airline industry will try and attract passengers back is by kind of discounting things. Many thanks for that. Um, Paisha, just a, a sort of quick question for you. Um, we've sort of seen that obviously the anti-China wave is becoming stronger in India at the moment, um, obviously in the wake of the recent border tensions. Um, the Indian government has tried to respond to this, obviously, by focusing on trade. Uh, given China's major trade and investment in India, uh, what do you think that the banning trade from China would have or what the impact would have in terms of both FDI and obviously trade uh, on India into the future? Mm. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, yes, I mean, short answer, I think um, any sort of trade ban or disagreement with a major economy uh, is likely to have some sort of an impact. Uh, as you rightly say, there's a fair degree of trade and foreign investment with China and foreign investment from China. Uh, and so how this plays out uh, is, is, is likely to have an impact on the Indian economy and Indian businesses. Some industries are likely to be more impacted um, because they are more dependent on Chinese imports. And I think Bedison touched on this as well. Um, so, for example, I think you know, there are some sectors like antibiotics, for example. China supplies a large chunk of them. Electronic products. Uh, China supplies a large chunk of electronic products and components. Uh, so some supply chains could really be affected quite quite significantly. And in a where there is already pandemic related disruption, further disruptions could be very could be damaging for some areas. That consumers could see price rises as well for a lot of products that they're used to getting fairly cheap. Um, and so there, there is likely to be some disruption. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, the Maharashtra government today suspended investment proposals from Chinese firms, I think worth around 5,000 crores INR. Um, so that's that's FDI uh, getting impacted. Um, there could be potential opportunities for Indian domestic manufacturers if they are able to be nimble and act swiftly. Um, India's got a very large domestic market as well, which relies pretty heavily at the moment on a lot of Chinese imports. Um, so will Indian businesses be able to switch to uh, reposition themselves to fill that gap so there could be opportunities but uh, i i think that is likely to be some impact at least in the short term cheers thanks uh, we've got lots of questions now coming in for, from the audience so thank you very much for them um i think we're going to start off i've um, got one here from ranjana um i guess and this is to, to you pranjal uh, what are the implications of a high public debt as a percentage of GDP? And what's the impact of that on the sovereign rating and investment worthiness? Yeah, uh, thanks for that. Uh, well, look, that is a problem. Uh, you know, 72% of GDP debt, even before the pandemic, uh, 
and uh, now even without a big fiscal stimulus uh, the debt is likely to to cross 85% of gdp you know through the pandemic i think these are these are big numbers and it's a problem but i think the big thing about uh, about debt the way at least the ratings agencies look at it is what is the trajectory in the medium term is it going to be explosive in the sense will it continue to rise or will it begin to fall uh, and and I think that's the sort of forecast uh, ratings agencies try to look at uh, to you know to, to sort of gauge amongst other things what it should do with, with with the ratings. So it's very important for the government at this point to focus on what does it need to get right to bring down the public debt as a proportion of GDP over the medium term. And if you see the things that impact it, while the amount of fiscal deficit is one, the other thing is GDP growth. If GDP growth is weak then debt actually explodes, it rises over time. But if medium term GDP growth is strong, it's high, then it deflates the debt and debt actually falls over time. So I think it's very important for the government right now is to focus on steps that will increase GDP growth over the medium term. And it's basically uh, you know, those that will really impact uh, you know, the ratings behavior of many of the rating agencies. In fact, an interesting one is already playing out. We had one rating agency, uh, uh, being fairly positive of about uh, of India's medium term, whereas another rating agency is fairly negative about uh, about uh, the medium term uh, growth potential, and 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 that really showed up in, in in the ratings that they had for the economy. So I think right now, if the one thing the government needs to focus on is how do you improve medium term growth of the economy. Thanks for that, uh, Vadasan. We got a question uh, coming from Sunil for you. Um, does the panel believe that the manufacturing represents an opportunity for India as organisations look to um, secure their supply chains? I guess and this is relating obviously to the the, the current uh, US in the US China uh, trade war. So, Vadasan, what, what's your thoughts on that? And and just maybe if you could sort of um, elaborate on what you think the Indian government could do to actually uh, maximize this opportunity yeah no sure i think uh, <clears throat> uh thanks Chris. so this is uh, this is a sector i mean this is a play that um, uh, i mean the government of india is actively working on um, so there is a general belief that uh, there is a lot of uh, anti china sentiments and manufacturing should start shifting out of china not ex not exactly shift out of china it's more of uh, uh, companies looking at china plus one model in other words in addition to China, we also need to have one other place, one other country where we can have a manufacturing facility or where we can still rely on a supply chain. So in, in that construct, I think India is not the only one. There are a lot of other countries that are still competing for this. I mean, we've got Vietnam, Philippines, Bangladesh. A lot of countries are competing for, for these alternative supply chains. And India is one of them. Um, the, the government of India is working on, on a program trying to incentivize. Now, India has a bunch of challenges. Uh, doing business in India is, is not as easy. Uh, um, and while the, while the government continues to work on trying to remove the bottlenecks, it, it's still not as seamless as uh, you would like it to be. Uh, and there are a number of challenges. I mean, it relates to the points Chris, that you mentioned earlier. It's all about land, labor and uh, capital as well because the cost of production the cost of manufacturing in india is quite high uh, so so india is competing with some of the other countries as well in terms of trying to attract supply chain now some of the schemes i mean as i said the government of india is working on it and uh, as period to see we are also working with the government of india on coming up with some suggestions around it but uh, what I would say is that, um, uh, so there are some, so for example, we got the production linked incentives program. So what the government is saying is like, if you set up a plant in India and if you meet certain production thresholds over a five year period, these are the additional incentives that we could give you. So those are some of the schemes that the government is working on. In addition, the, the government of India has also reduced the, the corporate tax rates. Uh, it's one of the lowest uh, in the world. It's around 15% for, uh, for a new unit. Um, so those are some of the schemes that the government of India has come out. Now, can we do more? Oh, clearly, yes. Uh, and we should be doing more because otherwise we run the risk of losing out, um, uh, losing out to, to other neighboring countries. Yes, thanks, Davidson. Um, Payusha, I've got a question here that's come in. 
uh, particularly around your comments around uh, the, su the succession planning. So the question is, can you expand a little bit on that? And also, uh, what do you think will be the impact of uh, the current privatization and disinvestment program that's happening in India? Sure, happy to. Um, so I think the, the, the government, when they were re-elected, um, there was a lot of talk about the privatization uh, and this investment program. Uh, I think this was going to be uh, rolled out from um, last summer onwards, uh, and there was already some of that. Some of that had started, uh, and certainly some of that we'd seen um, and heard that there was going to be lots more of that happening. Uh, obviously, the impact of COVID has paused a lot of that. Um, having said that, I think I saw some data the other day which suggested that four of the largest deals. Uh, in Q1 were government divestments. Uh, so some of that is still happening, um, perhaps not as much uh, as the government had initially thought. Uh, and they had identified uh, and released at the end of last year a, a, a fairly long list of, of assets that they were looking to divest. Uh, so I think some of that will happen. The government will be keen to continue that program. Uh, it'll essentially raise, uh, raise finance for the government as well. So I think that will happen. It may take a little longer. Um, the government may, may well wait till the economy stabilizes a bit uh, and then start that process. Uh, so I think that will continue. Uh, it will probably take a, long, a bit longer, but it will nevertheless continue. Um, your first question now about succession planning. It's really about how Indian businesses have occurred until now. Um, as you know, there's a role, very strong promoter culture um, in Indian businesses. Um, and so that's probably quite different from some of the Western economies. There's a world promoter culture, um, and while there are some companies that have moved towards a more professional management um, and the promoters taking a back seat, in many of the very successful Indian businesses, it is very much the promoter's business and the promoter's influence is felt very strongly. Um, a number of promoters are looking at the next generation. They're looking at succession planning, what next? Uh, and they're looking at um, doing joint ventures with, with international players. Um, they are looking at selling controlling stakes where they're not as involved anymore and there is somebody else who is running the show. So there is potentially a fair amount of that that could happen over the next couple of years. Uh, and you could even see a large part of the promoter, promoter businesses moving into professional management, being run by uh, professionals where the promoter is in a uh, more secondary position. I guess that's similar to the sort of the family houses that, that, that do exist and uh, maybe in, in in other territories. Precisely. Uh, exactly. Okay, thanks. Uh, Pranjal, just a question uh, that's come in here for, from Akash. He's asking, uh, what are the major risks to the Indian economy when such a high amount of money is available at such a low cost? And I'm guessing that's not just relating to India, but, you know, I think it's the first time, you know, in quite a long time, the UK bank, Bank of England is looking at sort of you know negative um, interest rates. So so what's the what's the the downside to that? Yeah. So um, look, uh, in in the past, if you look at any other slowdown in India, uh, I think the big risk to too much liquidity is inflation. You know, inflation spikes up very quickly in the country. Uh, but this time, it's a different kind of a slowdown. Generally, the slowdowns that we see are, uh, you know, supply driven. So there's a problem on the supply side uh, and any demand becomes very inflationary very quickly. But this time, the problem is a demand problem. Uh, and when, when it's a demand problem, then alongside growth, even inflation falls. And this time, uh, we are a bit lucky that this liquidity can slosh around for some more time without becoming inflationary very quickly. So, you know, that's, that's how I'm thinking about it for this year. But perhaps, uh, you know, towards the second half of next year, when I'm hoping that India starts recovering, uh, we'll have to be very careful. The central bank will have to be very careful and, and make sure that they're able to suck the excess liquidity out quickly before it becomes inflationary. Because, you know, in the medium term, these problems will remain. The inflation problem will, 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 will come back if growth picks up quite rapidly. But I don't think it's a problem for now. And the RBI can continue with excess liquidity and lower rates for longer. Okay, thanks for that. For that. Um, we've, we've got quite a lot of questions coming in. So if everybody doesn't mind, I'm just going to overrun by a few minutes. Um, Vadison, uh, a quick question to you.
Um, you talked about the sort of slowdown in the automotive and the construction sector. Uh, and what does that mean in India for steel imports? Because obviously that's a huge um, area. There is a lot of pent up demand that will require a rich supply. And has that demand uh, diminished um, in the medium term? Sorry, Chris, is that for me? I didn't. Yeah, for, for you, Vadis, if that's okay. Yeah, no, sure. Uh, so in terms of steel, I think, uh, so domestic consumption or, uh, of steel is actually going down uh, because of uh, because of decline, that you rightly said, decline in auto uh, electronics. Uh, so the demand for steel in India is going down. And so what, what Indian companies are doing is, steel companies are doing is trying to compete in the global market, which is never easy because uh, you've got a global giant uh, from China and uh, the cost of production and the rates at which China produces is not something that the Indian companies can uh, can can uh, compete with. So the steel industry in India is actually uh, seeing a lot of pain. And uh, so I'll just pause there because it's not a sector that I particularly cover, but uh, I would say that it, it it's a it's a sector which is seeing a fair bit of pain as well. Yeah, thanks very much for that. Uh, Hey, should just a, a question that's coming for to you from Spinner. Um, he's asking about what what are the sort of sectors or the opportunities that you see, um, sort of post COVID for India and for the Indian investors. Uh, for Indian investors. Yeah, that's correct. So, so what do you think will be sort of good value for money? What what sectors do you think will become sort of uh, quite investable sort of post COVID? Mm -hmm. um, I think on that one, it's it's, it's some of, it's mainly the ones I touched on already, uh, and it'll be the ones that are able to weather this crisis. So the ones that have very robust balance sheets or are able to be nimble during this time, conserve cash appropriately, and come out on the other side when the world is looking quite different. I think those will be companies that will be able to then invest in either other companies within India or look outbound. Um, and so I think there will be there's really two categories. One are companies across sectors which are able to weather this. Uh, and then I think there are uh, the, the healthcare and technology are the care players which will weather this better than others and in other sectors. Um, and I think those will be sectors which will where the players will. Uh, there'll be assets to invest in, as well as there could well be players coming out of it looking to um, either do mergers or do consolidations. Um, and then there's healthcare tech, which is again a global phenomenon, but that is really picking up as well. So I think those would be the main areas um, where I think there could be significant opportunities coming out of this. Cheers, thanks for that. Um, quick question for Kanjo. We've got quite a lot of questions that are actually coming in relating to self-reliant India. Uh, and do you feel, is that merely a slogan or do you think it requires structural reform in India? And if so, what sorts of structural reforms does, does that require? Yeah, um, look, I think, uh, I think the questions, uh, you know, basically answered itself that it, 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 I think India will only become self-reliant if it can, um, get a lot of reforms done and it can manufacture efficiently at home. Uh, I think there are some very important reforms for that and the ones I would shortlist um, are things like land, access to power and power related raw material and transportation. And I think if uh, if India can actually work on these three fronts, you know, on land, if it can, it can promote land banks where big companies can come and set up and where the regulatory cost will not be very much or if it can promise more reliant power by giving better access to the raw material coal, or if it can make the ports, the, the ports in India much more efficient than it is right now. I think uh, India can become self-sufficient over time. Uh, my only problem is that, you know, these are reforms we've been talking about for the last many years and they haven't yet happened. So, uh, you know, you can't say with guarantee that they will happen and India will become self-reliant. The hope is that the push is a stronger one than, than we've seen in the past. Yes, thanks for that. I think we've got time for one last question. Uh, so we've got a question, uh, Vadasan, if, uh, if I put this to you, it's from Professor Sabu Pandamanas from the University of Southampton, the India Centre. Um, he's asking about 
uh, the tremendous challenges that, that are there in terms of the potential lag in the economic recovery, uh, particularly for the informal sector and the impact of livelihoods. Obviously, two thirds of India population is currently, uh, you know, is the migrant workers. Uh, what do you think the, the effect will be uh, and what sort of uh, measures can the Indian government put in place to address them? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question, Chris. Thanks for that. Um, so you're absolutely right. I think uh, a big part of India I think, of the labor force works in the informal sector. And uh, if I take agri alone, I mean, agri almost uh, uh, employs almost 40, 45 percent of the total labor force in India. Uh, largely all the informal sector. And and then even within the the uh, uh, look at the main the main the main sectors, a uh, you've got a big part of the Indian economy living on on the MSME sector is one of the keys or core to to, to the Indian growth story. And uh, I mean the the MSME sector has been one of the most severely impacted as well. And what the government has done is is actually focused extensively in terms of the stimulus package in trying to revive the MSME sector because they're very mindful that the MSME sector is contributes a big part to the to the overall economic growth and importantly to the to the employment opportunities as well so i think uh, if if i look at the if you look at the stimulus package that the government has come out with the biggest focus if any has been on the msme sector and uh, that kind of in a way addresses the 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 informal sector is what i would say thanks now madison um, apologies to everyone who's put a question in that we didn't manage to get through unfortunately uh, time has uh, is against us and we've run out so I think it's just uh, sort of a final thank you to everybody from the UK, India and all over the globe for listening in to this UK IBC webinar. As I mentioned this is recorded and we will be placing this on the website. Um, I wanted to say a huge thank you to Pranjal Vadasan and Payusha for their experts um, opinions and for taking us through such a a difficult subject in, in such a difficult time. Um, so thank you to everyone. Please, of course, stay safe. And we look forward to uh, speaking to you and taking your questions on the next UK IPC webinar. Huge thank you to the panel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chris.